I monitor lots of sources on a daily basis and couldn't miss this article on The Daily Skeptic. Watch the game-changing new film that explodes climate change and net zero lies. Sounds lively. If it's game-changing, then I presume it has new content that we've not seen before, which makes it potentially worth a watch. I asked you in the community section of this channel which of three different ideas you wanted me to make a video about, and it was close, but responding to this movie came top. I also noted this comment. If you do cover the documentary, please devote half to what is accurate in the film and half to what is known to be inaccurate. Obviously, it kind of depends on the balance of the accurate versus the inaccurate that we get from the film. But I get from that a reasonable request. Don't simply pull out the bits that are wrong, but note both the hits and the misses. Which, fair enough. I did do one where I did exactly that sort of cherry picking a while back, when I pulled out a couple of mistakes that were made by Al Gore in some recent content of his. But you can argue that the things that Gore got right are just in the standard consensus, so the things that he got wrong were more interesting. All of that. So I initially created a few columns, claims that should be verified or challenged, fair comment opinions that may be agreed with or disagreed with, but which are reasonable expressions of opinion based on the evidence, the presence of contrary voices to ideas being proposed, which is the thing that tells you whether you're dealing with a campaign film or an actual documentary. And yes, it's mostly campaign films on both sides, of course. Let's get going. We start with a montage of outlandish campaigners and Greta Thunberg, and then a bunch of quotes from some fairly familiar faces. And this is just intro. The comments are out of context. But, you know, it's pretty evident from the start that... Yes, this is a campaign film. I mean, it's no big surprise there. The language is full of sweeping generalisations. Mass production, marched hand in hand with mass consumption. In the modern age, ordinary people enjoy a level of prosperity never before achieved in human history. Mass production and prosperity are good. Well, yeah, I agree with that in principle, but we do know there are a few ifs and buts lurking in the details there, right? And then we get this melange of statements. Computers have calculated what is in store for us as we produce and consume ever more. The weather will get worse. The planet will boil. We greedy humans must accept limits on our lifestyle. Consume less, travel less. Those who deny the climate crisis are not just wrong, they're dangerous spreading the poison of doubt among a gullible population. These deniers should be shunned and shamed and censored. These are broad generalisations, obviously. They make the mistake of throwing the science of what is happening with the climate into the same pot as policy proposals that some people are making as a result, and the name-calling between the two sides. You can point at some groups, sometimes quite fringe groups, sometimes even just individuals who have said each of these things at some point. Some of the others, yes, are genuinely often said and highly challengeable. But throwing them all into the same mix suggests that these are all said and done by the other side as one homogenous group. It's a process of othering. Yes, the United Nations Secretary General used the, in my view, stupid phrase, global boiling. But literally nobody is saying that the planet is actually going to boil. Then we have those familiar faces introduced, and their credentials are bigged up. One of America's leading physicists, one of the world's leading meteorologists, America's leading physicists, and so on and so on. There's an element of all of that, of claims from authority. So look, let's just deal with this quickly. When you introduce someone and give their credentials, you're saying, here is someone who knows their field. Fair enough. Now, their opinions, they may be right, they may be wrong, 
but at least that opinion is an informed one. And that's all. When someone's introduced onto a podcast, for instance, and you get their credentials, it's really so that you know a bit about the basis of their expertise. Nobody is saying that, therefore, you must take everything that they say on trust. When you're being targeted with campaign messaging, however, it inevitably goes a step further, where individuals are described as leading and most respected and renowned and all of that. It's not just a host being complimentary to a guest. They're saying you should believe this person's opinions because they are the best authority in the world, or at least amongst them. Now, Extinction Rebellion and The Guardian on the other side, they do exactly that with their favoured scientists, the ones whose opinions match the ap apocalyptic mindset that they favour. And so we also get it here. Well, let's take it for what it should be, that whether they're right or whether they're wrong, yes, these are people who understand science generally. They're not randos who just walked in off the street. Great. But the answer is the same as for everyone else. You still then judge the claims and the ideas based on their own merits and you expect them to provide evidence in support of those claims. After all, there's other highly credentialed people on the other side. By definition, someone must be wrong. So, for example, John Clauser is presented here as one of the most respected scientists in the world. Which actually, in his case, is fair comment, since he jointly won the 2022 Nobel Prize for Physics. Not in a field related to climate, but nevertheless. But then one of his co-winners, Alan Aspect, is on record as saying that the most important job of science is to solve the climate crisis. So, you know, lots of opinions. Just because someone knows their own field doesn't guarantee they're right about someone else's. So what's the evidence that has caused them to dismiss the climate alarm as nonsense? Now, at last, we are into the substance, even though they haven't defined specifically what the climate alarm actually constitutes. We've just heard a bunch of out-of-context stuff. But we're on to our first claim. We are told that current temperatures are unprecedented and dangerously high. It's possible to check if this is true because we have evidence of Earth's climate history. <laughs> so when we look back in time, what do we find? For 200 million years, dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Fact check true. An Earth marked by fertile, dense forests teeming with life. Let's come back to that one. And at no time during those 200 million years were temperatures as cold as they are today. Fact check true. My initial reaction is... So? 200 million years ago is a very different planet. The suggestion that something applied then, so therefore it would be just peachy if it suddenly applied overnight today. It's kind of a weird assumption. But is the claim even true in its own terms of reference? The Earth was marked by fertile, dense forests teeming with life. Well, yes, the dinosaur movies show that, even the hilariously bad ones used here. But what does the geological evidence actually tell us? Well, here's a map showing the single great continent in the first half of that period, Pangaea before it broke up and began the journey to becoming the continents that we know today. As you can see, everything in the centre there, a huge area, is the opposite of fertile dense forests. It was arid desert. That includes the latitudes now taken up by the United States and much of the rest of the world. The latitudes corresponding with Northern Europe was where the lush fertile forests were. That was tropical. Good for me. I love warm weather. Not so wild about tropical diseases, but, you know. The area to the south, that was temperate. So all those Americans who say, ah, climate change, we can adapt. Well, obviously they will be happy to move to Antarctica when the time comes. So yes, there were large areas of lush fertile forest, but let's superimpose the current geography onto those latitudes. How much comfort is it 
if where you live is in one of those hot arid areas that 200 million years ago some dinosaurs much closer to the north pole by the way were having a fine old time while those living in your actual neighborhood were surviving more hostile environments now we shouldn't even need to be having that conversation because it should be self-evident that the fact it was hot hundreds of millions of years ago is irrelevant to our current situation over geological time frames, i.e. tens or hundreds of millions of years, yes, life can adapt to fit many different conditions. It is rapid change that tends to present problems, as several periods of mass extinctions will testify. Take the words of Matthew Wielicki, a geologist quoted in the movie. We are in a remarkably cool period if we look over the last 550 million years. Well, yes, but again, so what? During that period, we have seen the entire development of agriculture. So you can argue it both ways if you're going to stick to this rather broad rhetorical style. Isn't it just as likely that we were able to develop agriculture because we were lucky enough to enjoy a climate that was compatible with it? I mean, look, maybe there's a perfectly strong case to be made that adaptation of crops and growing methods makes it all possible at higher temperatures but i would want to see that you'd put in the work into showing what that would actually look like not just statements like warm is better than cold in geological history we are a tropical species now at this stage i'm wondering when we're going to get to the groundbreaking stuff we were promised because this is old stuff and to be honest, it's not even the good old stuff. I note that we also get a lot of statements like But all the while we're told These are convenient because they don't give you specifics, which is a clear tell for a straw man argument. So for example We are told that current temperatures are unprecedented and dangerously high. Okay, told by who? No climate scientists are suggesting that current temperatures today are unprecedented in the history of the planet. The history of humankind? Sure, different discussion to the one that we seem to be having. And since the human population used to be so much smaller than today, and yet climate changes we've experienced saw populations forced to migrate from certain areas a number of times, often due to great suffering, doesn't even matter if you agree with that specific or not. You still have to get into the actual detail to make any sort of coherent argument. Very few are specifically saying that the temperatures right now today are dangerously high, just that they will quickly become so as the planet continues to warm. The movie doesn't give you a specific quote attributed to an individual of importance to the debate making that claim. It doesn't give a specific study making that claim, just we are told. And it sounds well echoed enough by some of the hysterical headlines we do get exposed to, even though most of them are actually talking about something to do with the future, or they are misquoting sources, which journalists often do, to sound broadly as though it must be true. We are told. Well, I want to know who by... Thank you very much. We also get some disputed claims being smuggled in. Several thousand years ago, we see the rise of the first great civilizations in a blissful period which, according to many studies, according to several studies, was considerably warmer than today. Then came the balmy medieval warm period, according to many studies, according to many studies, as warm or warmer than today. Several studies that you might cherry pick because they say kind of what you want to hear. But the most recent study suggests that these were regional phenomena. They were interesting climatic things going on, but they were warmer mostly in the northern hemisphere and in different places spread over an extended period of time. Now, look, I have no doubt there could be debate about the detail of those studies. It was a long time ago. Evidence is mixed. Ideally, you would look at that from a standpoint of curiosity into what happened, rather than desperately trying to make it a thing that you believe supports what you already want to believe. 
But let's just notice, yes, this is a campaign film. It's not interested in nuance. It's not interested in any doubt whatsoever in its own version of reality. It'll just make a statement and seek to smuggle it past you, saying, according to some studies, moving quickly on, nothing to see here. Then we get this graph from Lungfist, which they claim shows warmer temperatures in recent human history. However, this is a very well-known, misused piece of data. There is no way I can imagine the filmmakers are not aware to the responses of this being used in this way, but they don't acknowledge and try to answer the objections, they just pretend they don't exist. So first of all, it's based on just the Northern Hemisphere, in fact 90 to 30 degrees north, not global temperatures. If you look at the original paper this draft comes from, it makes no claims to represent global temperatures or to suggest that it has the implication that the movie makers are projecting onto it. In other words, it's interesting as a historical record, fascinating maybe, if we just want to know what was going on, but irrelevant to any discussion about global temperatures today. Second, it finishes before the recent modern spike in temperatures. If you add that in, well, it doesn't show that it's been warmer in the recent past than it is today, even exclusively in the Northern Hemisphere, rather the opposite. It's not even an outlier graph in the literature, as Lungvist himself noted. Although partly different data and methods have been used in our reconstruction than in Moberg et al. 2005 and Mann et al. 2008, that's Michael Mann, the creator of the so-called hockey stick, the result is surprisingly similar, as this graph that adds them together demonstrates. So it's purely what's being suggested to you as the implication for this graph that is different and important, not the graph itself. Now, I would suggest that is attempted manipulation. I can't see how you do that by accident in good faith in 2024. Then we get to what I would label as another red flag. The longest instrumental record of temperature in the world comes from central England, and this is what it shows. Since the worst of the Little Ice Age from 1650, the temperature has risen, gently, by little more than one degree Celsius. And there's certainly nothing very alarming that's happening today uh, at the very end of the record. Ah, yes, the one true data source phenomenon. Always, and I mean always, always mistrust an argument, I don't care which side it's supporting, when it depends on a single or a geographically highly selective data source. Whoopee! The current climate in England is relatively stable. Well, I'm delighted, because that's where I live. Actually, while pretending there's been no change, in reality I'm able to enjoy more and better local wines which are being produced today, because actually it's changing enough to make that a thing. People looking for opportunities to make money don't mess about with cherry-picked graphs. They kind of go where the evidence suggests there's an opening for them. And no surprise, because if you look at the actual graph from the original data, yeah, there's kind of some demonstrable warming there. But even then, so what? Again, the main debate is about future effects, not current, global, not just here. Distracting attention into debates about what's happening in one location today simply reframes the discussion in a way that's designed to maximise confusion. Where there are current effects, because they are starting to emerge, they're more affecting the tropics, where we would expect and where people are actually quite vulnerable. Looking at the England temperature record, because it's been kept for longer... It is exactly analogous to the joke about the drunk man who lost his keys looking under the street lamp because although that's not where he dropped his keys, that's where the light's better. It's exactly the same as that. Oh, and then we get another one from Central Park in New York. Really? That one location? A proxy for the whole world? Never mind the whole of America? Imagine if climate scientists had put that forward as an argument, they would be ripped to shreds. Then we have Will Happer making the claim, Most of the warming that we're observing today is the recovery from the Little Ice Age. Now that could make the basis of an interesting claim. 
Such a claim would need to be supported by evidence, or at least a hypothesis based on partial evidence. However, no evidence is offered, no reference is provided, it's a straight rhetorical statement of opinion. As the great Christopher Hitchens once said, arguments presented without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. What would you need to provide in terms of evidence? Well, you'd need to be able to make the claim that the factors that led to the Little Ice Age are measurably in retreat today. Now, Happer doesn't do that. In fact, I haven't seen any sceptics arguing why the Little Ice Age happened. It's just, well, you know, the climate changed in the past. Just random changing stuff happening everywhere. Kind of crazy. And that must mean that the same random stuff must be happening now totally beyond our ability to understand. Except, of course, nature is not random. Yes, it is complex. Yes, it is chaotic. But nevertheless, it is based on the laws of physics. And changes have causes, always. Now, we can largely detect modern causes. We can't measure what was happening hundreds of years ago in the change that led to the Little Ice Age. We can infer some of it from remaining evidence, but the longer ago something happens, the harder that gets. From what I've seen, scientists believe it's most likely a combination of solar, volcanic and sea current influences that led to the Little Ice Age. All feasible, all known factors that could lead to such an outcome. All of them today we are measuring. None of them are driving the current changes in global heat. So if Will Happer has a case to make that it was something else that caused the Little Ice Age and that same something else is driving the changes today, cool, let's have some detail, let's see some evidence. But like I said, no evidence presented, no detail in the argument made, so the rule of Hitchens applies. All right, we get an observation that in specific locations, the average temperature on a specific day from year to year could be as much as five degrees different. Let's look at New York Central Park. Records show that there has been no overall change in temperature here since 1940. But from one year to the next, the average temperature can vary by three degrees Celsius, without many New Yorkers even noticing. In fact, between the warmest year in the 1960s and the coolest in 2000, there's a difference of five degrees Celsius. That is a true claim. Fact check true. Weather varies from year to year. But why is that here? I mean, nobody that I'm aware of has ever argued otherwise. Now, look, you could easily do something similar. You could point to some of the young people misled by the extreme campaigners who wail in despair at every sign of bad weather, thinking that it's the forerunner of the apocalypse. So tiny but yes rather vocal minority that does that and that would be something you could easily disprove with reference to the historical record and i would then just be saying fair comment you know so long as you didn't overreach by suggesting that because a change hasn't happened yet that means it can't happen in the future but still perfectly good fair comment potential but instead we seem to have set up a straw man almost unnoticed, and so pointing out such obvious trivia seems to be disproving something that someone's imagined to have said. I mean, yes, like I said, it's a campaign video. Happer gets close to being more specific. You know, when I hear people pontificating about one and a half degrees leading to the end of civilization. I think, what have they been smoking? You know, are you crazy? Indeed, this is the most fair comment statement so far. It would be more effective if you were simply challenging the impression, falsely given by many, of the 1.5 degrees C increase on pre-industrial temperatures as a cliff edge. A lot of mainstream communications have done that, and you can criticise that. As most actual climate scientists will tell you, that has never been the case. It was true to say that you get more expected negative consequences with every 0.1 of a degree higher that you go, so it's not as though there's no substance and no consequence. But 
the setting of 1.5 as the number was a political act, done because some people felt it would be useful in motivating societies to develop a sense of urgency and take action. And the next threshold is 2 degrees C. The clue is in the relatively round numbers, a human preference, not a scientific one. Not that sailing past 1.5 and 2 degrees C is no consequence. Purely political. But how it was communicated was arguably stupidly black and white. But that's not the context that Happer gives for his comment. And it's not the context of a film which is going for a bigger target than some unwise political actors miscommunicating. That seems to me to be a missed opportunity. Really, look, I want to have two columns with a bunch of fair comment scores attributed to claims on one side and the others on the other. This is not my movie. Right now, that's not the movie we're getting. Then we get this one, a graph showing that since 1880, there's been only a very mild increase in temperature, only by stretching the y-axis in a truly nefarious way is the difference noticeable. This is pure manipulation. Let's call a spade a spade. When you create a graph, you have to ask yourself what is the appropriate scale to use. And that depends on the scope of the data, the impact of the thing you're measuring, the original graph that they're showing. Now, it seems to support what they say. Only a very mild change hardly shows up. Well, suppose instead of a mild increase, suppose we had a 5 degrees C decrease, colder, but by a mere 5 degrees. More than 1.5 degrees, of course, but again, on this graph, on that scale, you'd barely notice it. So, presumably not that important. Except just 5 degrees C colder is exactly where it was when we were in the last glaciation and miles high ice was covering Canada, half of America, as well as many other places. Well, that seems like quite a major difference to me. Feel free to disagree, but, you know, from that to this... So, do we think that a bit more of a granular look at the data on that graph might be appropriate? Given that on the scale they use, by the time there was a move upwards or downwards visually worth noting, you would be too dead to care. Seems to me that might be kind of useful. Then we get to the presentation and explanation of the urban heat island effect. Where there are more people and there is more human activity, there's more heat. And again, there is a true claim here. Where you have big cities and other highly developed areas, that generates more heat. However, the implication that a significant part of global warming is due to that effect, that is hard to sustain. Why? Well, you may have noticed most of the Earth is actually covered by water. We expect the oceans to warm more slowly than land, because the heat gets spread into the deeper oceans and there is cooling via evaporation. But even so, we see exactly what we would expect to see in the warming of the oceans. That is not because lots of airports and big cities are being built on those oceans, I'm guessing. Also, look, across the world, the vast majority of glaciers are melting. They are not in urban areas, obviously. And you can get into the arguments on its own terms. Scientists say that they adjust for the urban heat island effect. And if you only look at rural temperatures, it actually doesn't make that much difference. For me, that is an unnecessarily granular argument if the outcome doesn't actually prove what is suggested. That somehow global warming is an illusion created by this inbuilt human error. Certain campaigning sceptic scientists claim to have done the measures for rural-only areas and they suggest there is a difference. Others point at what he's done with the main figures that shows that there isn't. What you have there is an example that if you make an incorrect statement of detail on something that in principle doesn't matter that much anyway, the danger is you end up arguing endlessly about the detail which then suggests that it's important and it comes down to who you believe. 
But no, the urban heat island effect does not explain the growing heat content of the oceans and hence the majority of global warming. So look, there are lots of details you can pick and claims that can be contested, but the broad brushstroke approach to all this that we've seen so far in this movie, it's not exactly what I would have expected for a so-called groundbreaking piece of content. That takes us to 22 minutes in, where we get to the science part two. At that point, I think we've done enough for one video. This is already longer than my usual. So look, I'm sorry to my commenter who wanted a 50-50 split of true statements over here and false ones over there. Unfortunately, the quality of claim in the first 22 minutes of this movie is poor. The evidence provided is mostly long since debunked. There is nothing new, there's nothing groundbreaking, which is what we were promised. It's more like a greatest hits collection. But volume two, which means they're not even the great hits. I haven't watched beyond this point of this movie. Maybe it gets better after this point. I'm not highly hopeful given this start. So my question for you, should I continue? Do you want a part two to cover the next part of the movie? Let me know in the comments below.